So somebody asked me, I, I, I'm trying to remember who exactly asked me, uh, what are we doing after membership matters? So as most of you know, last uh, Sunday in equipping hour, that completed our time in uh, the nine course on membership matters. And somebody actually asked a question about um, Trellis and the Vine. It seems like we were doing really good with that book, that little book review towards the end. It was really, uh, you know, a lot of meat on the bone. And we, are we going to do anything with that? Are, are we just going to just say we've done that, been there, and then move on to the next big thing? And I do want to emphasize to you that we're not we're not forgetting what we came out of. And I actually want to thank all of you who are faithfully here, part of Equipping Hour. Uh, we went through the Membership Matter series, and even before that, we went through a couple books of the Bible. And it's really good just to uh, put the, the full use of this class is for people to be equipped, for the saints to be equipped with the Word. And so it's good just to see that happen, whether we're going through uh, Christian doctrine, or we're going through Membership Matters, or we're going through a particular, particular book of the Bible. So just want to encourage you that way. The, the year 2019, I think it was a good year all in all, just to see people kind of lighten up. And Marie and I, to this day, we're just thankful that we have a church uh, where people are people of the word. And that is not something that you easily come by at, at all. Um, so it's, uh, once you find it, you want to adhere to it, hold to it, and, and, and grab it, make it yours, own it. And so we do that with, uh, with regards to this fellowship as well. But uh, I thought what we would do is, is still not forgetting what we've been through, is, is this all ties into Christian doctrine, membership matters, trellis in the vine, is to, to launch into, for next year, this is looking ahead to 2020, to launch into next year uh, a particular book of the Bible, which I think we can cover in a matter of three months, which is the first quarter of the next year, and that is the book of Ezekiel. And I will get into the reason why I chose this book. You know, some people would say, well, why don't you start with Genesis and just keep on going with Bible survey or something like that? Why the book of Ezekiel? I don't, I don't know how many of you know of a son or brother or uncle who has the name of Ezekiel. It's a very odd name. So um, even the name Ezekiel, you may know somebody named Jeremiah or uh, Isaiah, other Old Testament prophet names, but, you know, who names their son? Ezekiel. It has a kind of a funny name, even kind of funny feel to it as well. And uh, there's a reason why we are going through the book of Ezekiel, and I think it's very relevant uh, in view of or, or in light of the state of our nation right now and how it is uh, somewhat of a, not somewhat, but is very much a struggle to be a Christian in the, in the current era, in the current times in which we live. And you will kind of hopefully see that more and more as we get into the book of Ezekiel. So at the top of your outline, hopefully you all have a handout uh, in front of you. Uh, we are looking at the book of Ezekiel in class number one, the in introduction. I'm not going to really cover um, everything. Of course, you don't even have time to cover everything in the book of Ezekiel. But I at least want to give you sort of a touch and feel of the book. So sometimes if you th I say Genesis, you automatically think of the garden. You think of the serpent. You think of Abraham. If I were to say the book of Matthew, which we're studying over here, you would think of Jesus Christ, the kingdom of God. But if I said Ezekiel, how many would go, Ezekiel, Ezekiel, what? And then you question mark, it's actually a big chunk of the Old Testament. It's 48 chapters. It's almost 50 chapters of writing, of Old Testament writings. And it's, a, it's a major prophet, which means it's more lengthy than the other prophet writings of the Old Testament. But yeah, sometimes when you hear that word Ezekiel, you go, oh, well, I don't, I don't, I'm not sure if I understand what I'm supposed to think when a person says, Ezekiel, what am I supposed to even think? So it is a, uh, this is not in your outline, just to get, kind of ease into this to give you a taste and a feel of the book of Ezekiel. It is a very confrontational book along the lines of faith and obedience to God's commandments or the lack thereof, the lack thereof. And of course, that's what the book of Ezekiel is really addressing the, is the lack of obedience or adherence to God's holy law. And even looking at the, the consequences of that on a national level, even looking at the capital city of Israel, which is the capital city is Jerusalem, and how they finally were carried off by the Babylonians when the, uh, it was just seen after so many centuries that they were not interested in really following Yahweh as their Lord. So it's a bit of a, 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 bit of a downer to, to read the book of Ezekiel because you're going to read about some of the most visceral, um, hard passages addressing sin. It's almost where God says, you know what, whatever you think about sin or, or your sin or other people's sin is probably the conventional way of thinking is sort of 
sort of a marginal understanding. Well, you know what I'm going to do? You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to give you my view of sin, and your jaw is going to drop to the floor when you see it from through my eyes. And it's almost like God takes his, his GoPro, or what do you call those cameras that are uh, you put on top of your head, those uh, GoPros, right, cameras, one of those video cameras, and he puts it right into the temple, and you see exactly what's going on in the temple. And it's not temple worship. It's a bunch of paganism. It's a bunch of idolatry. And, and God lets the people of Israel know, the people of Judah know, hey, I know exactly what's going on here. I am not, there's no smoke screen with God. You, don't, you, you can put a smoke screen with other people, say, hey, I'm okay, I'm doing fine. That's not really true. But with God, there is no smoke screen. He sees right through everything. And so you're going to see just a, how God displays his own, even his own emotions on display to the reader about how he is, he is upset. He is angry with the wicked. And there's going to be a flip side of that as well, too, is after the, the purging effect of God's wrath goes past Israel, goes through Israel, you're going to see about his beautiful narrative of restoration, how God restores someone. This very much brings the memory of Peter in the New Testament. Peter was that very zealous disciple of Christ. And of course, Peter, in his zeal, uh, did a bunch of things not right. And, and there's at the very end of the story of Christ and Peter, where Christ basically restores Peter and says, Peter, look, do you love me? Do you love me? Yes, Lord, I love you. I love you. And then finally, Peter, you see him being restored. Um, and so here in the book of Ezekiel, it's like that at the very end, you see a blissful, wonderful display of just full, thorough restoration of a fallen people who have finally come to their knees. They, their knees hit the floor and they finally repent and the Lord restores them as a future people. So we're going to get into all of that, and, but it's a pretty uh, amazing book. Now, most of you, when you look at page one of four, you probably have a question mark on your head and say, why is God, or excuse me, why is John talking about this stuff about Twitter? And I'm going to get into that as well, too, for in a second. The purpose of our time is to relate to the early Jews in exile. This historically happened um, um, more than 2,000 years ago, 200, <coughs> 200, 500 years ago. To relate to the early Jews in exile, leaving their glory days, entering into hostile territory, always looking ahead to the kingdom of redemption. And that's where the, the book of Ezekiel ultimately ends with, with Temple glory, the, 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 the temple that was once desecrated is restored in an amazing way that's over the top that I can't even explain in a single sentence. It's just over the top. But you're going to see how uh, this looks ahead to that temple of kingdom glory. But it is to really backtrack and, and really to trace and to follow the, the, the footsteps of the, of the Jewish people um, in Judah. And that's the southern half of Israel is Judah, where they uh, understood that... Um, there was hypocrisy in the land, and, and it just went on and on and on. And it, there came to a, a boiling point in which God had to basically purge his, his own people group, his own Jews, of their disobedience. And he did it in a very uh, even violent way. It, it is to identify with the Jews who are going in exile. They're coming out of their homeland, and they're going into a strange land. They're going into Babylon, and they're leaving their glory days when they had uh, the, the wonders of their own territory, their own land, the land of their own possession, their promised land. They had that, but they lost it because of their disobedience, and God carried them off to Babylon, which is on the other side of the desert eastward. They left their glory days, and they entered into somewhat of a hostile territory, pagan territory. As they were doing that, they always had to look ahead to the kingdom of redemption, which Ezekiel is basically unfolding for them. So this is a very interesting story because uh, Ezekiel is actually carried off with the disobedient people. And this is, just, this is just kind of interesting. You know, I mean, Ezekiel is a faithful priest. He's working in the temple. God gives him a vision, and it comes to the point where God says, okay, I'm going to unleash my wrath upon these people for their disobedience, for their idolatry, for their hypocrisy. Ezekiel is actually going to be carried off with his fellow countrymen to Babylon, and he's going to be sort of their go-to person, uh, uh, almost like a shepherd to them, as, as he articulates to them how they are to live in view of their new, their brand new uh, surroundings, which is Babylon, which is very hard, very difficult. 
I do believe this is something that we could relate to even for ourselves in America today, not to say that America is like Israel. I know people make that mistake. You know, we, the nation of the United States of America, we're just like Israel. Well, hello, we're just another Gentile nation. We're not Israel. Uh, but there are things that the early Old Testament saints experienced that we could say for ourselves, uh, even though I don't dress like them, I don't have their hair, I don't have their robes, I can kind of identify what they're going through with, with just a, a sense of seeing a, a nation, a nation that once uh, had a, a sense of God, fearing the Lord, fearing God, in some measure had a, had a sense of that. And all of a sudden, that's out of the window. And all of a sudden, 20, uh, all around you, 360 degrees all around you is pagan, pagan, idolatry, 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 idolatry. And how am I to persevere in such a time as this? When everything basically says your Bible is wrong, your God is wrong, Christ is not the only way. Everything 360 degrees around you basically says something contrary to biblical Christianity. How do you live in a, how do you live in a time like that? Very frustrating. And even in, sometimes we feel it in our, own, in our own bones too as well when we recollect you know, the times that we have personally disobeyed, disobeyed the Almighty ourselves. And we may even feel some of that with regards to the, the ebbs and flows of the, God's judgment in the world around us as well, too. We feel it in our own bones. So this is something that <clears throat> I, I don't believe, again, that Israel is the United States of America. The United States of America is Israel. I don't go there. But this, at the same token, by the same token, it is something that you, as a believer, as a struggling believer, can identify with what Israel was going through they were leaving their glory days, all those days in which they had uh, good memories of, of, the, of the name of God being broadcast loudly across the stadium. And everybody said, ah, oh, that is the God that we follow. Hooray, hooray. And all of that is now, hush, hush, don't use that name anymore. You got to do it a different way now. And they had to adapt to the Babylonian way of thinking. Of course, they had uh, things that involved friction and persecution is there. If you read the book of Daniel, you'll understand how that is. The very top of your outline, I have the question, and I think this will help move things along, and that, that is the question, what if God was on Twitter? And this gets into the, the, the transparent component of the book of Ezekiel. When you get on Twitter, what you get is maybe too much <laughs> Transparency. Have you ever heard the statement, you know, that was a lot of information? Maybe too much. You know, maybe, maybe you could just curb a couple of the words, maybe say things uh, not so straightforwardly. <laughs> but on Twitter, you don't get to, 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 to give a rejoinder like that. You, it's just coming at you. And this is exactly where the, where the person is at. This is exactly where they stand. And so with Twitter, that's exactly what it is. And so it is with the book of Ezekiel. You get the, the visceral reaction of God's seeing the sin in his own holy land and how God is going to react just on impulse, almost frame by frame. And this is sort of the, the sense of the, of the book of Ezekiel where you start to really see it from God's perspective, just like when people, people are on Twitter, they are forced to see it from the person's perspective that's being broadcast to everyone. I know that's in the pejorative way of talking, and I don't mean to talk that way about the book of Ezekiel, but it's similar in some ways. It gives you the real gut reaction of the person who's experiencing something. That's what Twitter does. So on the top of your outline, Twitter, what is Twitter? I think everybody knows what Twitter is. It sends a short electronic message to a large online audience to up update them as to what is happening real time, moment by moment. It was used to the extreme by the President of the United States in the uh, past election and also in politics. Uh, Twitter also allows you to understand what a person's first-hand gut reaction is to something, be it good or bad. It has been used to elevate the virtuous and cancel out those seen as vile, has given birth to the cancel culture. And this is the culture that we're in right now, by the way, it's called the cancel culture. And, and that is where people don't do a whole lot of investigation about what your view is or how you came to your view. They just get this little sound bite and they make a judgment and they drop the yellow flag and you're out. You're canceled out. You're defriended. Um, isn't it wonderful that God is not like that? Where God knows the inward parts of the inner person and before God makes a judgment call, he gives them advance warning, plenty of time to repent before anything is thrown down at all. Twitter, it's, it's more vicious. 
Uh, it's, it's more get back to that person, tell them how you think, and then and then da 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 da, and it's just ongoing argumentation. But with God, it's not like that. Uh, he's not distant from the person who's 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 listening to him, who's hearing his commandments. He knows their inward parts. So in contrast to uh, the conventional way of communicating, which kind of relates to Ezekiel, in some ways it does not re- relate to the words of Ezekiel, the words of God in here. But we want to look at God and how he, how he corresponds to things. He sees all, he knows all, he judges all. Unlike Twitter users, God actually knows the inward parts of every participating individual. This is the very thing that escaped the religious nation of Israel back then in two, uh, 722 B.C. It was then that the northern half of Israel was carried off to captivity by the Assyrians. God was not being mean. God gave his people repeat warning that if they didn't stop mixing idolatry with his stipulations for true worship, they would suffer the consequences. And I want to just stop there and explain that something just that's very for, important for us to understand when we talk about the wrath of God or the judgment of God or God's judgment of his own covenant bound people. Uh, this is not something where he just, you know, on a whim wakes up one morning and says, I got to just end this right now. This, this is going too far, you know. Um, it, it, is, it is preceded by centuries, generations of warning, warning, warning. And that's through the prophets. That's through the Old Testament prophets or, or some other prophet that came on the scene. But it, it's, it's, it's communicated to the people, either from the, from the writings of Moses or from a live prophet come on the scene to, to warn the people. So there's none of this, uh, you know, drop the yellow flag, Twitter, cancel culture, you're out. Three strikes, you're out. God is a God who is known for <sighs> long nosedness, which means long suffering. He's slow to anger. He's not reactionary. He, in fact, he's very, very patient. And so what you're going to see here is just by looking at your outline, you can see the number of years that are between 722 B.C., the northern half of Israel, and the southern part of Israel in 586 B.C. is taken away after them. I mean, you have long periods of time where God is actually saying, okay, I'm going to give them their first dose and that's northern Israel in 722 B.C. It's different, different armies. It's going to be the Assyrian army. They're going to take away the people who are disobedient there. The northern tribes, the northern ten tribes were way more worse with their kings of being disobedient than the southern part. But God's going to lead them into captivity by a foreign army. You would think that, you know, if the, the northern part of the United States of America, let's just say the part between the Canadian border and um, the Oregon border... <laughs> Was, was carried off by the North Koreans or something like that because of the disobedience of our country, you would think, you know what? We need to stop our stinking disobedience because I think God means business. I think he really does. That was sadly was not the case with Israel. They saw their own countrymen, their, their own people carried off, and they still stuck with their own stinking disobedience. Uh, they did have times of renewal, Hezekiah, with the King Josiah in Judah, there was just a little bit of renewal, not a whole lot. But they pretty much steamrolled their way into judgment. That is, the people of God did back then. God gave his people repeat warning that if they didn't stop their, their idolatry, uh, they would suffer the consequences. That goes back to the Mosaic law, the law that they were under, the covenant promise that they were under, that God would judge them. If they disobeyed, God would bless them if they did obey. You would think that after the north was carried off, the southern half would be woke to the fact that God is serious about what he says. Sadly, in that year, the year of, of uh, Ezekiel's writing, around 586 B.C., the Babylonian army, a different army, toppled a vile Jerusalem. And the faithful priest, Ezekiel, went out with them, probably wearing chains or something like that. This is um, going to have a, a book that's going to have a lot of focus on the temple. And it's appropriate that we understand that Ezekiel was a priest. And you can understand when a priest sees his temple being raided by Babylonians and stripped to pieces and burned down or whatever, how does that going to affect the priest? In, 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 a very, in a very close way. It would be sort of like if you're a preacher up here, you're a longtime pastor for many decades, and somebody comes in and takes the pulpit and breaks it down and turns it into firewood, you would be like, oh, 
you know, I had so much, I had so much history with that pulpit, and now it's just being discarded, it's being desecrated. That's probably what exactly Ezekiel felt like when he saw all this come down, seemingly all at once. But it wasn't not it was not all at once. It was with repeat warning uh, by the prophets ahead of him. So this is going to get into some serious stuff, and I am going to read actually read a portion of Ezekiel to give you a, sort of a taste of it. This is a footnote. The last paragraph on page one of four is a, it's more of a footnote to all of this. Going back to the trellis and the vine. Uh, we went through the book of the Trellis and the Vine. It was basically on evangelism and discipleship, mostly discipleship. It was a very practical, engaging book that we left off with from the previous Equipping Hour series. And we are not done with it, not at all. Uh, we are going to find out as we go through any book of the Bible, and specifically the book of Ezekiel, you're going to see how the book of Ezekiel builds up your con- conviction over doctrine, over who God is. One of the things that is most pressing in evangelicalism today is the right understanding of God's holiness and God's wrath. Uh, Sometimes that gets lost on how do you articulate that God is holy and God has wrath towards sin. At the same time, God desires that all be saved as well, too. We're going to get into that as well, too. But that's uh, one of the main things that uh, if we are to be built up in our faith or even our knowledge of the gospel... We have to know something about how God really sees sin and how he has a righteous wrath when when a sin is on the scene or or there is no repentance in the land. So we're going to get into that a little bit too. Also the patience of God and all the things that work with that as well. So there's going to be things that have to do with our doctrinal convictions coming out of the book of Ezekiel as well as there are things that have to do with Christian character. And one of the things that I, I, I think uh, most of us, well, maybe not all of us here, but I know I do struggle with this sometime, is how do I have strong conviction over doctrine, which I'm going to guard till I, 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 blood is drawn from my vein. I will, I will protect, I will guard doctrine at all costs. But at the same time, how do I have a sensitivity for the people coming from the unbelieving world where they're just saying, hey, I'm a Babylonian, and then we do this all the time. You know, we think it's great. And your jaw drops to the floor and say, that is totally pagan. That's totally, that makes God angry. How do you articulate that? And even how do you go about the whole thing about long-suffering and patience with a disobedient people? Uh, those, are, those are topics, those are themes that will come up out of the book of Ezekiel. And they, they tie into Christian ministry. They tie into discipleship. How do you disciple somebody who is, uh, you know, doctrine schmockrin? You know, they, they may not be really doctrinally set, doctrinally tied down, kind of fluttering to the, with every wind of doctrine, that sort of thing. How do, you, how do you still have a sense of compassion for that person, still wanting to work with that person? Uh, you see in, in Ezekiel the, the, the very heart of God, how he still longs for his own people to be restored, fully restored on all sides. So this does tie into the trellis and the vine. It does tr- tie into discipleship and many other things. Okay, I've said enough about page one of four. I want you to turn in your outline, and you can see maybe a humorous thing. I hope you can spot my humor in the outline of Ezekiel on the inside. But at the t- upper left there, you have a sort of a, a tic-tac-toe sign. What is that tic-tac-toe sign? It starts with the letter H. Hash something. Hashtag. I think it's used in Twitter and other things as well. I'm not on Twitter right now. and I, <coughs> I'm not on Twitter and ignorance is bliss. I'm going to say that right now. I don't have no idea what I'm talking about. But it's the idea that... Um, you, if you want to get a, a, a good, strong thought across on the internet, you put a hashtag, and a person goes to that hashtag, and they get the run, they get the whole rundown on where you stand. And so, what we have here in your outline is sort of a, a three-part block of main headers to the chapters of the book of Ezekiel, and this just will carry us through and give you sort of an overarching view of how Ezekiel is written. I find personally that it's written in three distinct parts. You can maybe break it down into more parts than that, but there's three main portions of the book of Ezekiel. The first one has to do with hashtag out of here, and let me explain to that what that's all about. Um, first of all, we know, we know of, of just in our multimedia and our social, uh, social media atmosphere where many people are just impulsively ready just to say, I'm out of here, I'm done with this relationship, and that's where the cancel culture comes. They defriend somebody and they just said, phooey, I'm out of here. I'm done. 
Um, and we're going to contrast that with God's divine version of out of here. God actually does say to his own covenant people after they disobey for so long, he does say to them in so many ways, in so many shows, I'm out of here, which is, that's a hard thing to say when, you, and when the God of Israel, Yahweh, is like Ichabod, the glory of God has passed from here, he's gone, he's out of here. Where does that leave the people? Well, it leaves them in shambles. Um, and we're going to learn about that in a minute. So the first part of the, the book is actually about um, understanding about how God, after so many years, so many generations have passed, uh, he is ready to actually leave his temple. And he's going to get up and actually float and, and rise up out of his temple, out of his chair, out of his throne, and his chair is actually going to move to a different location. That has to do with the fact that God is mobile. So, so, so many years, Israel, when they went to Jerusalem, when they went to the temple of Jerusalem, they said, this is where our God is at. You want to know where the God of the universe at, is at? Go to Jerusalem. Go to the temple. That's where he's at. That's where the, the Ark of the Covenant is. That's where we, 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 we do all our ceremonies around the temple that Solomon built. This is where God is at. And just imagine in your mind, all of a sudden, you cannot say that anymore. When they, you go to the temple, it's full of cobwebs and ash. And people go, where's the main event? Where's the main event? Well, you know what? He left. He's gone. He's out of here. Because we disobeyed him repetitiously uh, with a sense of not wanting to give up our sin. And so he finally said, I'm going to rise up and I'm going to move out. We're going to actually see this uh, uh, visibly uh, in a vision of Ezekiel. So if you want to turn your Bibles to Ezekiel chapter 1, I'm, I'm going up ahead of our, our outline just a little bit, but I do want to give you sort of a touch and a feel of the book of Ezekiel. And you're going to get from the, the sense of this passage, uh, God uh, willing to just relocate, relocate himself to a different area, and, and that is to, to leave the, the, the nation which has been disobedient for him so long, to him so long. So I'm reading from the book of Ezekiel, chapter 1, starting with uh, Ezekiel in Babylon. You're going to go from uh, this being talked about in the third person to uh, Ezekiel in verse 4, giving his own testimony in the first person later on about what he saw, the vision, and how it relates to where God is going with this. Ezekiel chapter 1, verse 1. In the thirteenth year, in the fourth month, on the fifth day of the month, I was among the exiles by the Kabar River Canal. The heavens were opened, and I saw visions of God. On the fifth day of the month, it was the fifth year of the exile of King Jehoiakim, the word of the Lord came to Ezekiel the, the priest, the son of Buzi, in the land of the Chaldeans by the Kabar Canal. And the hand of the Lord was upon him there. Now Ezekiel writes in the first person, As I looked, behold, a stormy wind came out of the north, and a great cloud with brightness all around it, and fire flashing forth continually in the midst of the fire, as it were a gleaming metal. And from the midst of it came the likeness of four living creatures, and this was their, their appearance, and he gives them their, their, their appearances of the four creature. Jump down to verse 15, about uh, learning more about the living creatures that encircled the throne, and you're going to see the whole throne rise off the ground later on. Verse 15, now as I looked at the living creatures, I saw a wheel on the earth beside the living creatures, one for each four of the four of them. As for the appearance of the wheels and their construction, their appearance was like gleaming of beryl. And the four had the same likeness in their appearance, the construction being, as it were, a wheel within a wheel. When they went, they went in any of the four directions without turning as they went. And the rims and their rims, this is talking about the wheels, were tall and awesome. And the rims of all four were full of eyes all around. This is still talking about the, the wheels that encircle the throne of God. And when the living creatures went, the wheels went beside them. And when the living creatures rose from the earth, the wheels rose. Wherever the Spirit wanted to go, they went. And the wheels rose along with them. For the Spirit of the living creatures was in the wheels. When those went... These went, and when those stood, these stood, and when those rose from the earth, the wheels rose along with them, for the spirit of the living creatures was in the wheels. Now, this is very strange and very weird, but 
uh, in the mind of, of even the Babylonians and uh, creatures with wings that touched each other, that would be something that they would see in their mosaics, in the, in the things in, in their own culture. So that it was not strange to the culture of that time. But this is obviously a vision that, that elevates and looks upward to Yahweh the Lord and his ability to, to actually relocate himself. Verse 26, and above the expanse of their heads there was the likeness of a throne. Its appearance was like sapphire, and seated above the likeness of the throne was the likeness with a human appearance. And upward from what had the appearance of his waist, I saw as it were a gleaming metal, like the appearance of fire enclosed all around. And downward from what had the appearance of his waist, I saw as it were the appearance of fire, and there was brightness all around him, like the appearance of a bow that is in the cloud on the day of rain, so was the appearance of the brightness all around. Such was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord, Yahweh. And when I saw it, I fell on my face, and I heard the voice of one speaking. He said to me, Son of man, stand on your feet, and I will speak with you. And as he spoke to me, the Spirit entered into me and set me on my feet, and I heard him speaking to me. And he said to me, Son of man, I send you to the people of Israel, to the nation of rebels who have rebelled against me. They and their fathers have transgressed against me to this very day. The descendants also are impudent and stubborn. I send you to them, and you shall say to them, Thus says the Lord God. And whether they hear or refuse to hear, for they are a rebellious house, they will know that a prophet has been among them. And you, son of man, be not afraid of them, nor be afraid of their words, though briars and thorns are with you, and you sit on scorpions. Be not afraid of their words, nor be dismayed at their looks, for they are a rebellious house. And you shall speak my words to them. Whether they hear or refuse to hear, for they're a rebellious house. I'm going to stop there at verse 7. You get the sense of this where Ezekiel has his commissioning and it's just over the top. First he sees just this weird, almost UFO-ish kind of appearance of all these circling fiery wheels going up in the air with eyes all around. Basically saying God sees everything, God sees everything, God sees everything. And the throne is lifting up, and you, all of a sudden you see God go airborne up with his throne up in the air. And it's going this way, that way, that way, that way. Now this is going to connect to another passage that we're going to look at later on. But you start to see that God is, he's not sitting in the corner in some back office saying, I wonder what those Israelites are up to today. He's very much on top of the situation. Very much on top of the situation. And that is a comforting reminder to Ezekiel. Ezekiel needed that. You'll find out this with the, most of the prophets he write about. The visions that they saw, though they be bizarre, they needed those. They needed a memorable picture of God being on top of the situation so that when they went into battle and they, they confronted the people over their sin, they could do it steady, eddy, just like God would in their midst. And so the idea here is, is very clear. It's very clear. You're going to talk to the people and they're going to go like this at you. Uh, Ezekiel, no, 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 no. And you're going to go, boom, 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 boom. Don't give up. Don't give up. Don't give up. That's exactly what God told Ezekiel to do numerous times. Don't give up. If they have a frown on their brow, you make your head all the more like stone. I mean, that, that's, the, that's the fighter. God is building up a fighter. That's what God is doing here in this passage. And he could even be saying to us as well, too, even with all the sensitivity towards long-suffering and patience and grace and all of that, still be a fighter. Don't give up. The God who is above the throne, above the heavens, he's leading the pack, and you're his subject. You're supposed to do what you're supposed to do. Don't give up. And that's exactly how Ezekiel is being exhorted by God, by Yahweh the Lord, who is not bound by any location at all. So this is the, uh, the over idea of out of here that God, you can tell with the wheels and everything and his chair going up in the air, there's a sense in which God could easily relocate himself to a different place. And that is startling in the mind of the, of the Jewish person who's very familiar to God only being one place. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, always Jerusalem. The Holy Land, the Holy City. And God says, I can be anywhere I want to be. And that's good if you're going to Babylon on the other side of the desert that God could even be what? There as well. 
He's not limited. Beautiful, beautiful picture. Beautiful picture. So this just gets you the, the, the wider scope of things with regards to how God is, in one sense, he's out of here, but he's not just dropping the yellow flag. He's not just canceling out somebody willy-nilly. He's actually given them lots of time to prove themselves faithful to him, and it's only at the last, last resort he, did, he does what he does. Um, I'm not going to read everything there, but I do want to just cut, capture something while we're in the book of Ezekiel, while you have it open, is turn to chapter 5, and this relates to the, the north, south, east, west. You see that with the wheels, with the four creatures, four, north, south, east, west. Um, later on, you're going to see how God uh, responds to not just Israel's disobedience, but to the nations around him. So I'm actually going to start with uh, chapter 5, verse 1, and read all the way to verse 10 about how Jerusalem will be destroyed for a certain reason, not just for their own disobedience, but it corresponds to the nations around them. You'll understand this in a moment. As for you, son of man, take a sharp sword. This is one of the weird things about the book of Ezekiel. The book of Ezekiel has a lot of weird things in it. But Yahweh the Lord tells Ezekiel to take up a sharp sword and use, a, use it as a barber's razor and pass it over your head and your beard. Cut off some of your own hair. Then take balances for weights and divide the hair. A third of it you shall burn in fire in the midst of the city when the days of the siege are completed. And a third of it you shall take and strike with the sword all around the city And a third of it you shall scatter to the wind, and I will unsheathe the sword after them. And you shall take from these a small number, and bind them in the skirts of your robe. And of these again you shall take some, and cast them into the midst of the fire, and burn them in the fire. From there a fire will come out into all the house of Israel. Thus says the Lord God, this is Jerusalem. I have set her in the center of nations. This is very important. In the center of the nations with countries all around her. And she has, def- she has rebelled against my rules by doing wickedness more than the nations against my statutes, more than the countries all around her. For they have rejected my rules and have not walked in my statutes. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, because you are more turbulent than the nations that are around you and have not walked in my statutes or obeyed my rules and have not even acted according to the rules of the nations that are all around you. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, behold, I, even I, am against you and I will execute judgments in your midst in the sight of the nations. And because of all of your abominations, I will do with you what I have never yet done I will and I will uh, and the like of which you, you will never see again I will never which I will never do again therefore fathers shall eat their sons in your midst and the sons shall eat their fathers I will execute judgments on you and you will survive I will scatter uh, and you who survive I will scatter to all the winds now there's a very important verse about that you understand God's visceral angry hatred of sin. This is ongoing idolatry, it's paganism that's been going in the the land, the holy land, for years upon years, centuries upon century. And this is where God finally says, throws down and says, you know what, I'm serious about my threat about being a judging God towards sin, and this is what's going to happen to you. Uh, You're going to be ending up uh, going through a time of cannibalism where you're surrounded by your enemies on all sides. The Babylonians are going to be on your all sides, and you're going to be stuck in your own city to the point where you actually have to cannibalize your own kids to survive, that is for food. This shows you just how stark the book of Ezekiel actually is, and this was something that was prophesied from from previous times. This is nothing new to uh, the the life of Israel or the knowledge of Israel back in those days. They knew this this was going to happen if they continued to disobey. But I want to give you a picture of that that's very important how God sees it. Verse 5, chapter 5, verse 5. Thus says the Lord, this is Jerusalem, and I have set her in the center of the nations with countries all around her. You have to understand, Israel was supposed to be the prized people of God in the midst of a pagan people so that all the surrounding nations around her would look up to Israel and say, you know what? There's a better way of doing it than how we've done it. The way we've been doing it, it just destroys family, destroys relationships. It's all of the devil. How should we do it? Look to Israel. Look to their obedience. But what's the problem here? The problem is that, is that Israel, as that 
priestly, kingly nation has decided to go, "Uh uh-uh, I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to obey Yahweh the Lord. So what's going on here is all the nations, they have reasons to go, hee hee ha ha at Israel's disobedience. Look at Israel. They're just like us. In fact, they're worse than us. Uh, They make us look good. And the pagans are saying that. What God does is he raises up Tyre. He raises up Moab. He raises up Ammon. And this is from the north, south, east, and west of Israel. He raises up all these nations to topple Jerusalem. Now think about the geometry of that. I just want to talk about geometry a little bit. North, south, east, west. Think about that. North, south, east, west. What does that sound like? The wheels of the, the, wheels of the throne of God. North, south, east, west. Four. What about the temple? You're going to read about the temple later on towards the end of the book. What's, that? What's the imagery there about the sides of the, of the nation? It's north, south, east, west. So there's, there's a, a ge- even a geometric relationship between God's judgment raising up the, those nations on all sides of the compass against Israel, but on the, on, the, on the tail end, when he raises up Israel to restore them, and when he raises up Jerusalem, I should say, to restore Jerusalem, he raises them up on all sides with a bigger amount of land than they ever had before, and that's going to look forward to the, what's called the millennial kingdom. So you get the gist of this, that this, this involves a lot of interaction with a lot of other things. We're talking about the wrath of God, the patience of God, the, the long-suffering of God. You read about that in Exodus chapter 34, uh, verse 6 and 7 in your outline. You're going to learn about how God actually uh, is aware of the nations. Uh, sometimes when we, we, we open the newspaper or we look at your favorite news program, whatever that is, you get a review of the nations, and it's usually benign. Nobody's really evil except for maybe Russia and now it's Ukraine or something like that. They're really bad. But everybody else is pretty benign. Everybody is pretty much okay. Maybe China is bad occasionally. But you're going to see what, how God sees it with regards to the nations, that the nations are actually against his holy law because the nations are made up of rulers who are pagans, typically pagan unbelievers with just a few exceptions. So you're going to even see here with regards to how God corresponds to the nations. that He's not just going to judge Israel. He's not just going to judge Judah or Jerusalem. He has a plan to judge the nations as well too when they rise up against his holy law. We don't have time to go there, but read on yourself, read on your own uh, Psalm chapter 2, verse 1 through 3, uh, talking about how the nations gather around the Lord and, and they try to, 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 to strike against God's law. And God says, no, I will not have that. You can read about Revelation chapter 20 and the eschaton, uh, the the end of the age where all the nations rise up uh, against Jerusalem one last time in Revelation chapter 20 and how God responds to that as well. So we're going to get into some deep stuff with regards to even international things, the nations that surround Jerusalem, the nations that surround the land of Israel as well. And the last hashtag there in part three of three is actually talking about the millennial, millennial kingdom. And I need to comment about that word millennial. Uh, That is a very popular word today, millennial. Uh, Millennial is usually referring to, in our current vernacular, it is referring to people who were born uh, previous to 2000, so that when they, the the turn of the century, they were adults. So if you were born in, like, say, 1995, most likely you would be considered a millennial. But when we are looking at the millennial kingdom, we are not looking at a particular cut of, of, of the demographic of the United States of America. We're actually looking at a literal, I, I see it as a literal, uh, some people don't see it necessarily as a literal, 1,000 year long period of Christ's futuristic uh, kingdom reign. And this is the big uh, pickup after your heart sinks and you read so much about the siege of Jerusalem and what God did to basically say, I'm going to clean house in this land once and for all. Your heart sinks to the ground when you read passages like Ezekiel chapter 5. After that, way after that, when you get to Ezekiel chapter 33, 36, 48, you're going to learn about God's restoration. God, how God is going to bring his arms around a broken people because they, they broke his law and they're broken from the inside out. And he's going to gird them up. He's going to bring them back. He's going to raise them up. And I have in your outline, I'm not going to read every single part. You can read it on your own. But sometimes when we talk about the millennial kingdom, and some of you may be eschatology buffs. I don't know how many here are eschatology buffs. But if you're an eschatology buff person, that means you're really into end times theology. You automatically know exactly how Revelation chapter 20 connects to Ezekiel's temple, the millennial temple. Of, of the backside of the book of Ezekiel, you know all those things maybe by heart. 
Uh, what I want to do here is something that I think is very needful and purposeful, and it's to back off that just a little bit. So I am going to, we do hope to get into the millennial kingdom and the millennial temple and what that looks like in the end times, uh, looking into the future. This is not something you can see in Israel today. There is no millennial temple in the land of Israel today. This is all in the future. But what I would hope to do is to give not just the, the literalness of that and, and, and the dimensions of the, of the temple, which are given there in Ezekiel uh, chapter 40 through 48, but I want to give the spirit of it as well, too. And that's important. And it, it's, uh, I forget who the person who told me this first. I think it was Rick Holland who used this phrase in my ear the first time. But it has something to do with seeing the forest between, before the trees. That does not mean that you don't examine the trees You still are going to examine the trees. You're still going to do what you're supposed to do verse by verse when you need to do it. But seeing the forest before the trees, this is very relevant for Humboldt County because we know what forest looks like here. This is not the desert. This is Humboldt County. But seeing the forest before the trees is, is, you're not looking at the bark. You're not looking at the the leaves or the the size of, of of the pines. You're, you're backing up, you're backing up, and you're looking at the whole forest, and you're saying, this is the panoramic view of everything. And I think what you can do with regards to Ezekiel's temple, they, they call it Ezekiel's temple, and the, the millennial temple, as some people call it that, you can do the same thing. See it from God's perspective. See it from the early Israel's perspective. See it from the captives of Babylon's perspective. See it from Ezekiel the priest's perspective. With your own eyes, you saw the temple desecrated, cannibalism in, the, in your own homeland as people tried to survive with food from their own kin. You've seen it all, and everything is just bloody, burnt to the ground, and it looks disgusting, full of cobwebs. And your memory is basically, well, well, I, I think, I think we're, we're totally, <laughs> we're a done people, we're done. We, we, God's, so, God's so done with us. We disappointed God so much. He's, he's, he's rightfully, I won't argue with God, he's rightfully done with us. And Because you have those memories in your mind, the whole, the whole the pulpit crashing down, everything going through the roof. And then God says, you know what? After, after the halfway point of, of this book of Ezekiel, he says, you know what? You know what? I'm going to do something that is going to blow your mind away. I'm going to not just give you a new temple. I'm going to give you a land that you would never have imagined you would ever have, ever. And the dimensions of this temple is going to be so pristine. Everything is going to be orderly. There's going to be celebration. It's not going to be trampled upon any longer. And all of a sudden you go, well, I <laughs> I thought he was all done with us. I thought he was done with us. I mean, we, we, heard him, we heard his feelings so bad. We did so many bad things in his presence, in his temple. And God mercifully, because God is gracious, comes back and says, I, I, I want you to see this. I'm going to give you a new heart. So this is before we get to the furnishings of the temple, before you get to chapter 40 to 48. I, we're not even in the architecture yet. Before you get to the architecture He says, I'm going to talk about your human frame. Now, you're just a bunch of bones, chapter 37, laying on the ground with ash all around you. This is what I'm going to do, God says. I'm going to take those bones and I'm going to raise them up and say, bones, bones, come up, come up, bones. And the bones start going like this and flesh starts coming on them. Just out of just seemingly out of nowhere. In chapter 36, God says, your heart, your heart disappoints me. Your heart is like, a, like charcoal. It's like a stone. But here's what I'm going to do, chapter 36. I'm going to take your heart of stone, pull it out, and replace it with a heart of flesh that's pliable to my word, and you'll obey me from then, that point on. To, to Ezekiel, remember, see it from his perspective. See it from the early Jews' perspective. They're, they're just trying to comprehend this. Wait, wait a second, we're, we're done with, look at, we're, we're surrounded by the Babylonians. We see an idol over here. We see an idol over there. We see an idol over there. We see an idol behind us. That's because we're doomed, right? 
And God comes down and he says, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to deliver you in a way that you would never think in your, in your farthest imaginations before. And ultimately, this culminates in Christ's kingdom coming to earth. That's why we're in the book of Matthew, considering Christ's kingdom come to earth and, and the anointed one, God's own son. But this is the cadence and the flow of the book of Ezekiel. It's, it's something that goes to the, the, the starkest lows, the, the kind of lows where you go, I don't want my kids to attend this class because they'll go home with nightmares because of the things I learned about what God did and exactly how God chastened his own people. They're going to have nightmares when they go to bed. I, I don't think they can handle this. To the highest highs, the highest highs where God is, is saying, look, all those nations around you that, that toppled you, they're going to be bowing down to the God of Israel. They're going to be bowing down to my anointed ones. And they will be traveling up to you. He said, I'm going to raise you up above the heads of all the nations. That's from Isaiah chapter 2. That, that's the culmination of this. So I want you to get kind of excited for that. Again, this is for all for the purpose of us persevering in Christ, uh, seeing uh, God treat us even as a covenant people ourselves. I will end on this note. It's an important note that all of us need to comprehend. And that is that the church, the people of God, you are a covenant people. That's something, that word covenant is, is not used as much as it should be in Christendom. Covenant means you're bound. You belong to God. He belongs to you. You belong to him. You belong to his son. His son belongs to you. You're bound. And that's under the new covenant. And we're going to learn more about the new covenant later and how God expects us to walk in faith obedience to his new covenant stipulations, which we will get into later on. But this does relate to us as well. I'm going to close in pr- with prayer because I've gone too long over time once again. But let me just close in prayer. And if you have any questions, you can just call me afterwards. Our dear and heavenly Father, we just thank you, Lord, for the refreshment of the rain. Lord, it's a sign, uh, Lord, of, in many ways of, of just your care upon this land. Uh, and Lord, just, it's a sign that you are sustaining us, Lord, uh, year after year, uh, generation after generation. We thank you, Lord, how you've done that with regards to this church in particular. Lord, you have sustained our, our bodies, Lord, our minds. Lord, it even uh, kept the word in our homes. Lord, kept it open in our laps. So, Father, we just pray, Father, that your glory would go forth from this place. Lord, as we adhere to your, your law of love, Lord, as we, as we read about from your holy writ. We pray all this in your name. Amen.